I found in Robin a kindred artistic spirit and fellow life traveler. We became dear friends and confidants as well as colleagues. Robin is a producing partner on my own uh, project, which is a off-Broadway play called Consent, also about the line between desire and action. Great minds think alike. After all these years, I remain close with Robin's brother, Michael. They are indeed my best friends, so I got a two-for-one deal out of this family. Like Robin, I only came into my own as a realized sexual being once I reached a certain age. And like Robin, and like her heroine Lara Leeds, we both willingly and simultaneously began exploring our sexualities with newfound creativity and zeal. Broken Open is a brave and romantic portrayal of a lifestyle many of us fantasize about, but few have the courage to explore. I applaud Robin, not only for her amazing writing, but for her, for her bravery and skill in rendering what many seem taboo in such a way that we all can relate, enjoy, and be entertained. So with that in mind, I'd like to invite Robin Reineck to the podium to entertain us and titillate us with a selection from her magnificent erotic novella, Broken Open. Robin. Welcome, everybody, and thanks, David, for that great introduction. I hope I live up to it. I want to deliver on that promise. Uh, I feel like I'm in an episode of This Is Your Life because you guys come from such different areas and times and decades of my life. And I want to thank you all for being here tonight and making it a richer experience for me and for participating in this experiment. And uh, with that, I'm going to read you the first letter in Broken Open. And let me set the book up for you a little bit. S the first letter is being read by Lara Leeds, and she's received this letter from the wife of her boss. And she's having an affair with her boss. And as she's reading this letter from his wife, she's wondering, why is the boss's wife writing to me? Okay. Without further ado, from the desk of Andrea Thane to Ms. Lara Leeds. You don't know me, but you'll recognize the name on my letterhead. Surprised? Ha! I guess you've grown accustomed to unusual behavior by now. And of course, so have I. Unless you thought you were Sam's first. He might have liked giving you that impression. I can see my husband now, approaching your office cubicle, lanky and long-legged, in his business suit, silk tie knotted at his throat. He places a large hand on your desktop and leans forward, blue eyes sparkling, cheeks flushed, flying high on his drug of choice, adrenaline. Nothing beats landing a big account, Sam says. Couldn't have done it without you. Waiting for your smile, Sam's eyes seem serene, the color of a cloudless sky. His jaw is stubbled. It's after five when the beard he combats regains lost territory. But you probably think his shadow jaw is sexy. Those fine prickly hairs on Sam's urban pale skin offset his pinstripe suit. The burgeoning beard jazzes up his face, adds a bad boy patina. So Lara leads. You can't help but smile as your boss, your handsome bad boy boss, leans close to compliment your work. And then, as your lips curve, the boss's own well-formed mouth breaks into a conspiratorial grin. A tiny warmth flares in your chest, maybe a warning tingle too. 
celebrate with me, Sam Thane says. A single lock of his close-cropped black hair falls into a half curl on his forehead. You stiffen in your swivel chair, but he urges, come on. His claret grin goes crooked. I'm heading for Jack's bar. He gestures in that general direction. Don't you deserve to celebrate too? And you do deserve something, you find yourself thinking. Aren't the graphs you prepared for Sam Thane's latest presentation virtual works of art? Haven't you spent tedious hours at your computer screen inputting data for Thane PR's extensive comparison charts? Don't you deserve some of the boss's energy, some of that easy effervescence bubbling over your desk? Champagne he offers. And that settles it. And Lara, champagne is all you share that first time. Champagne and a touch or two. Yes, Sam's big hands feel warm on your shoulders when he helps with your coat. And straightening your collar, there's a second, slower touch. Now you're not stupid, my little friend. You notice the boss's hand hovering near your jaw. You feel the backs of his fingers graze your chin. But you don't move away. Not while Sam's cerulean eyes hold yours. Not while he murmurs, as though you're not meant to hear. As though he can't stop the words from flowing. I've never felt so drawn. Then his sky blue eyes widen, running over your face as if you're a miracle. As if he's transported by awe. Later, Lara, you may wonder about that gaze, those words, what they promise, if anything. But while Sam talks, you are filled with light. I know. His eyes intoxicate. His touch is as tender as a prayer. The full force of his attention is an addictive drug, a religion that delivers salvation in the now. Over the next few weeks, your stolen hours together grow sacred, set apart from ordinary time. At work, your boring routines are infused with desire. Secrets swell your chest. Deep down inside, you feel special. Between visits to Sam's clandestine apartment, you cherish that special sense. On second, oh, you thought I didn't know about the lavish lair on 40th Street and 2nd? The boss's custom-designed, fully equipped one-bedroom hideaway, conveniently located near your Midtown office, has been up and running for years. Larry, you're not the first woman, secretary, assistant, junior account executive, to walk across the plush bedroom carpet letting the finest charcoal gray wool caress the soles of your bare feet. No, Miss LL, does anyone call you Lala? You're not the first to lie beside Sam on his fabulous possum fur bed cover or take a soaking bubble bath in his big circular black tub. I taught him about Accutane. Do you like it? A superior product. Accutane makes the water foam with bubbles that don't dissolve but last. So Sam can mold the glistening white froth into snowballs. The first wet fluff gets smoothed over your shoulders. Perhaps he kisses your neck. Next, he tongues each of your nipples, gives one a gentle bite. Does Sam ask you to extend one leg out of the water, draping your knee over the black marble and letting your calf hang outside the tub? Does he form a fragrant, white, light as air mound and froth your dangling foot? I can see him tickling your instep, spreading foam up the back of your calf into the crease behind your knee. Next, his long fingers slide down your thigh, sloping into the tub. His hand dips below the waterline, seeks your most vulnerable open flesh, finds your hidden layers blooming and submerged. Has he shaved you yet, Lara? Sam loves the little girl look, the innocent pubis, smooth and bare. Do you find the exposure thrilling? Or do you sometimes wonder 
If you've become too vulnerable, your grown woman's sex lips strict defenseless, rendering the sensitive salmon pink tissue more accessible to Sam's strong tongue, his dancing fingers, his thick purple cock. I'm certain Sh Sam's shaved you himself by now. He likes to take control. I can see you sitting on the circumference of his black marble tub, sipping the cristal he orders by the case. He spreads your thighs. Light jazz plays in the bedroom. It takes trust to let a man approach your nether parts with a straight razor, doesn't it? Lara leads. His single braid flicks open into a switchblade, but a little risk is part of the fun, and the cristal relaxes you, right? There, just a bit wider, my darling. Open your legs. You already know Sam's touch is gentle. His fingers nimble and firm. On his fingertips comes a tiny puff of foam, shaving cream. How tenderly he paints it on your pussy. I know what I'm doing, he promises, before scraping your skin with the blade. And he does know what he's doing, doesn't he? Sam's tone is persuasive, and his fingers are talented, so you spread wide to let him get close, straight blade in hand. You obey instructions, shift positions, so he doesn't nick your sensitive skin, but shears your pussy bald. Then, spreading a plush black towel on the dry tub floor, Sam directs you onto your knees. Bend over. He gestures your face forward, forehead to the towel. Lift. His hand guides your buttocks up. Spread. He shows you how to pull your cheeks apart, bearing the fine fuzzy hairs in the crease, then kissing your tailbone, palming the rounds of your butt cheeks. He waits a long moment before raising the straight razor to shave every hair from slit to anus. Later, when your pubis itches, the discomfort reminds you of Sam, making the itch poignant a souvenir of your time together. It's comforting to have tangible proof Sam Thane cares about you. Too often your boss is busy, hurrying past your desk with a wink and a wave instead of inviting you to his apartment. Doesn't it drive you crazy that he keeps no routine? It's clever though, you must admit. No way to get complacent. Each time Sam invites you, it's a gift. There's no taking him for granted. But ever wonder, Miss LL, why the boss is playing with you? You're not the most poised or striking, nor the obvious pick of the lot. Yes, I've passed your office cubicle. Even though you were new at Thane PR, I've seen your face and learned many useful things. For example, you have long black hair. Sam must love to brush it. Lara, when my husband brushes your fine, straight hair, do you ever think of me? I hope you don't pity me, my little friend. Sam's taken his brush to better locks than yours, to gold and auburn tresses. He always grooms his women. Smooths lotion onto their flanks, combs through their manes. He hand feeds you strawberries dipped in chocolate, doesn't he? Along with tangy seedless grapes, cubes of cheddar cheese, he pops into your mouth. And off his fingers, your tongue licks organic peanut butter from the health food store. Sam Fain has you in training. I can see it now. He makes you lie down on the possum fur bedspread, takes off all your clothes, then, standing up, looking down, loosening his tie, he's still in his business suit. He says, touch yourself. What, you ask the first time? Touch yourself. Poor Lara, you're flustered now. Did you know that turns Sam on? He likes that you're awkward, insecure, easily controlled. Yes, 
Who are your boss's type? Self-conscious, young, unaware of your strengths, malleable and eager. Masturbate. His tone is hard, and although you're naked, lying on a married man's fur bedspread in his clandestine apartment, the word comes as a shock. Do it, a hiss from the handsome mouth that's tongued every inch of your skin. Reluctantly, you bring your hand to where your sex is as naked as a five-year-old's. Open your eyes. Sam's voice is raw. Look at me. Do you say I can't, but open anyway? Do my husband's sky blue orbs pierce your chest, pin you to the bed? Move your finger, touch yourself. I wanna see you do it. Eventually, under Sam's relentless gaze, you comply. Eyes open, pubis stripped, fingers circling your clit. You let him stand over you, fully clothed, watching. And when you finally surrender, you discover you love the exposure. You love the terror of being seen and the unconditional acceptance of the seer. You love his commands because they relieve your timid soul's fear of failure. Follow Sam's orders and you will always be right. You will be groomed and fed, adored and petted. Don't you love the attention? And doesn't it hurt when that attention withdraws, when Sam's sparkling eyes move off? When your boss leaves town for business or pleasure, when he doesn't call over the weekend, when you find yourself wondering about me. Lara, this Tuesday evening, June 1, I'll be at Vincent's Cafe, corner of 23rd and 3rd, 6 p.m. Will you come? Thanks, folks. I got to admit that it's the first time I read some of those words out loud in mixed public. <laughs> I was, I was wondering how that was going to go. It's one thing typing them. It's another thing reading them. So you guys were all great. I felt a lot of love from the audience, and that's what supported me. And uh, if you have any questions, now's the time. <laughs> Afterwards, I'm going to sign some books. You're afraid to ask questions. I could tell. <laughs> OK. Can you tell us about your upcoming uh, book there? Oh, thank you. Oh, this is my audience chill. Yeah, you guys. Um, I am going to be at the Columbia Alumni Book Fair on October 11th. And uh, that's from 11 to 3.30 at Columbia University. So, hey, I'm, I'm real thrilled with them. They took me once back in 1978. And they took me again when I applied this time. So God bless them. And God bless you all. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Is is the book totally has color? Is it all letters? Yes, it is. It's it's all letters. It's an epistolatory novel. I know that's an almost impossible word to pronounce, and 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 most people have no idea what it means. It means a novel entirely written of letters. And I will say that there are a few documents in the novel which are not letters, but it's entirely written of letters and documents. So I did too. <laughs> uh, years ago, I read Les Liaisons Dangereuses. I think we were all growing up, and it was all letters, and I loved it. It's stuck in the back of my head. <laughs> hey. The question is, uh, you've been with my wife for so many years talking about writing, writing different pieces. I wonder what inspired you to create this book. You know, that's a really good question. I honestly write it to, wanted to write a book where I wanted a sexy book that was not a morality tale. I wanted people to do things that 
seemed like they might be bad and then reveal a motivation that shifted how you understood what was bad and what was good. And I wanted people to do sexy stuff and get away with it. <laughs> As opposed to I, I did not want a morality tale. You ever notice in Hollywood, they let you be sexy and terrific and bad, but you know somehow sooner or later something bad happens to those characters. So I wanted it to wanted people to get away with some bad things, and I wanted their bad things to be understandable. I wanted us to be able to identify with them, to realize, hey, underneath what's looking like this crazy, sexy stuff, there's some heartfelt stuff, there's some interesting stuff, there are real people, and I want it different. You did that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, funny you should ask. I'm currently working on bringing out with my dearest and best friend, I don't want to say oldest because I'll get in trouble, um, a book about a memoir about raising her two kids and her entire family together. Uh, we don't have a great title for it yet, but it's coming. We're about halfway through, and it's terrific. And uh, she, my friend Marguerite, right over here, she raised two special needs kids. Um, and uh, sorry, this is what you get for asking me the question. So look for it. it you, it's going to be surprisingly soon. It's going to be entertaining. It's going to have photos. It's going to be poignant and uh, really different from this book. Uh, Expect different from me, you guys. I don't know what I'm going to do next, but it won't be the same. And uh, of course, let me just say, as David said, we, we are putting together an off-Broadway play called Consent, and my uh, co-producers are here in the audience with me, Andy, David the playwright, my brother Michael, and it's going to be a fantastic play about power dynamics in relationship, and anyone who's interested in helping produce that, come see me, or David. It's, it's going to be terrific, you guys, really. Erwin. Yes, probably. How would you describe how Laura changed from the beginning of the book to the end? And would you say that Sam and Andy changed at all from the beginning of the book to the end? Oh, wow, that's a great book club question. How would I say Lara changed? Certainly Lara changed. She became more open. One thing, she experienced being with a woman, which had never happened for her before, and she came to understand her own strength, in a way, through experimentation and through taking risk. And also, she came to understand the strength in allowing yourself to be vulnerable. This is tr there's a tremendous strength in that, and she's exploring that in this book. I think, I don't think we see a change in Sam, and I'm not sure about Andrea, I think, I don't want to reveal more about the book, so I, I, I don't want to get, answer that question too closely. But would you agree that Lara's perception of herself and of the uh, people in which she was orbit around uh, changed? dramatically, perhaps 180 degrees, where the way tradition and 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 uh, Gossel transformed and made her a, a strong person and, 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 and a much different person from what she was at the beginning. I certainly think Lara's experiences were empowering for her, and I would expect her to be a stronger person going forward in, in life now. 
So, uh, did that answer your question? Yeah, so I guess what I'm, I'm asking, it wouldn't be possible for her to repeat the same kind of experience. No, yeah. I don't think she'd be interested. Having, having gone through it. No, I don't think she'd be interested a second time. Because now, now she's followed that experience all the way to the end. She's really tasted where that leads. And I don't think that same thing would intrigue her another time. Uh, but she might follow a different experience. Do you think that one of those experiences might be one of the other male characters in the, uh, in, in the book? Just like his book. Well, I, I'm not going to answer that question on the grounds that it may incriminate the book. I really want to leave the book open. Like there was, there was an, uh, 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 an opportunity to uh, for, for, for that character to really uh, blossom and maybe just the limitation of the, uh, of, of, of the project it didn't permit for that, but it left, it left so many, it, it left so many questions about what could happen. And the, the two minor characters, uh, Terry, yeah. uh, Terry and the other one. We didn't read it yet. Oh, yeah, yeah. Don't blow the book. Don't blow the book for the crowd. Also had, uh, had, uh, had great potential to Erwin, I'm going to have to write a sequel for you. I can see it coming now. What happened after? Okay, prequel. All right, well, you know what? I'm going to take it as a compliment. If you want more, that's good. Okay, okay, excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay.